I remember being at Garden Oaks Elementary School in the second grade, and John Kennedy was elected president. Our parents were teachers, and if they were home by five o'clock, we ate dinner together. We ate dinner, and the news was always on television as we ate. I wrote a letter to President Kennedy. You remember the paper we used to have in elementary school where the lines are at the bottom, and you can draw a picture at the top? I drew a picture of him at the top. I thought it was a picture of him at the top. <laughs> That's what he looked like to me. I wrote him this letter telling him how very happy I was that he was elected president. Well, I got a letter back. It says, the White House. And the postage stamp on it is four cents. Of course, it's not signed by President Kennedy. It's signed by some guy named John Duggan, special assistant to the president. The president received your letter. He appreciates your ideas. Thank you very much for writing. <laughs> I was a very wild child. You can ask anybody. And I've always been strong. When I was a child, the doctor said he had never seen a child in his life that was as strong physically as I was. I was the strongest child and I was probably one of the strongest women physically. I could beat the whole football team in arm wrestling. <laughs> Reading has always been important to me. I read and read until I had an eye injury that made me wear a black patch over my eye for a year. I could not read a book for a year. It was difficult, but there were things about it that were interesting. At one time, we had 21 bird dogs, a squirrel, and a rabbit. And one time, while I was in bed with my eye, it was winter time, and the squirrel entertained me because he would get in this window on one side of my bed and, and lick the ice off, race across the bed to the other side, and lick the ice there. I would try to sneak up on him, but he would just turn, chatter at me, and race across to the other side. Uh, we played like that forever. He also chewed a hole in my gold Stetson hat and made a nest in it. That had been my Christmas present. <laughs> I grew up in very rural settings and very urban settings. I was born in Pawnee, Oklahoma. And I lived in Shawnee, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Enid, and Ponca City, Dallas, Wichita, and Los Angeles. I think I averaged two schools every year from the first to the sixth grade. Went to six different high schools. Just as we got settled and made new friends, it would be time to move. So I got used to reading a lot. That was part of my recreation. Going into different worlds was through reading. My thrust in life really wasn't academic. It was to play basketball. And being rather short, there were a number of things I had to do to make myself more competitive. Back in those days, you didn't have a lot of stuff you could go to the local sports store and buy. So, my mother took an old pair of Converse tennis shoes, sewed some fabric on the outside of it, and my dad melted lead and poured into the fabric to make lead weights so I could run in the summer. <laughs> I would run and run and run. Therefore, I got to play on the high school basketball team. That was the basis of what I would later talk about, leadership, and how important it is on a team to find your particular role. Some relatives, not close enough by love to really matter, would command the awkward girl with the eyes that didn't match. Pick up your bare feet. Don't drag them across the splintered floor. Pick up your flower sack dress. Hanging on the rusty nail. Until a woman called from outside the broken window. Pick up your name and write. We are a mixture of all the significant people in our lives. My mother and father taught me to how to care about the world around me and the people around me. Going to the movies on Saturday night on the way home, my dad swerved the car because he thought he saw a sack of potatoes in the road. He pulled off, walked back, and a person got up out of the road and started running. My dad caught her and got her into the car with us and we took her home. She was trying to kill herself 
because her father want, was going to make her marry someone she didn't want to marry. We kept her a few days while mother and dad talked to her. You have to picture my father, six foot four with arms that were quite muscular due to the work he did. He went to reason with her father, and the upshot is they took her home and she married the person she wanted to marry. My parents got married at 17. Both of them extremely bright and talented, articulate, well-read, but not able financially to go to college. My dad would have loved to have been a doctor, and my mom wanted to be a nurse, but that just wasn't in the cards. Our whole lives were art. That was the family business from when Daddy was painting and they were going to art shows all over the place. I always drew when I felt like it, but I didn't really do it consistently until after Daddy was gone. Our Uncle Tony, he stepped in and had us do art as children after Daddy was gone. He'd have the whole neighborhood doing artwork. Indian or not Indian, he had everybody in there doing artwork. And we'd win wherever we went, especially if he was the judge. First, second, third, all his little students. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Mama's gonna buy you a mockingbird. If that mockingbird don't sing, Papa's gonna buy you a diamond ring. If that diamond ring turns brass, Sister's gonna buy you a looking glass. If that looking glass gets broke, I'm to buy you a billy goat. Hannah Atkins, the first African-American female elected to the House of Representatives, encouraged me to run for delegate to the Democratic Convention at age 18. You had people whispering in the background that this slot was usually reserved. Well, I didn't have any sense of that. I just knew that they wanted women, they wanted young people, and they wanted minorities. And I was an 18-year-old young black woman who was indigenous to Oklahoma. A reporter for the Daily Oklahoman wanted to do a story on the youngest delegate elected to the Democratic Convention and the youngest delegate to the Republican Convention. So he interviewed us for the story. I had a short fro and I thought I was pretty cool, you know, Miss Activist. Anyway, Mr. Carl Albert, he was the House Speaker then, saw that reporter hand me the article. Young lady, I don't think I've met you. What's your name? Vicki Miles. I'm at Vassar College. I want to go to law school in Washington. Well, you might look at Georgetown, too. I want to go to Howard, where Justice Marshall went. That's fine. If you come to Washington, look me up. Maybe you can work for me. In my little community and surrounding communities, there weren't many jobs. A few businesses, none of them were native owned. People, the teachers, the nurses, the doctors were not natives. Only the custodians, secretaries, and laborers were. I used to wonder about that. Why don't we have native teachers? Or why don't we have doctors and nurses? Any, anyway, my mother would say, that's why you need to get an education. Go to school. You could be one of those. William Elizabeth McDaniel, poet. Born December 22, 1918, near Stroud, Oklahoma. Daughter of Benjamin Fletcher McDaniel and Anna Finster. In November, Anna was stricken with the flu. The country doctor took Benjamin outside and told him not to make any plans for his wife, and most especially the expected child. A radical preacher, when hearing the news, proclaimed, God will make a liar out of you and stood forever on his prophecy. I could always draw, but there was no art classes that I can remember. Actually, I graffiti the walls and stuff. It wouldn't just be on my paper. They used to paddle back then. I was always getting paddlings. My grandma, my dad's mom, she's a rebel. She had to come to the school and say, if you spank her one more time, she laid the law down to them. I remember mom going down there and telling them, you'll be sorry someday. This girl is going to be famous. Come and gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept that and soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the time 
law school, I clerked for a federal judge, then worked for the Department of Justice in Washington, then tried to get in on the U.S. Attorney's Office in Oklahoma City. I was feeling pretty rejected when that didn't work out, because who would want to come to Oklahoma except for someone from Oklahoma? <laughs> Not knowing that I would one day be U.S. Attorney. I walked across the street to the District Attorney's Office, that big fellow with the cowboy hat and a string tie named Bob Macy. I did not have an interview. I just approached my resume in hand and persisted with his assistant. She kept saying, well, I don't know, you don't have an interview. And I kept thinking, if I stand here long enough, he has got to come out. I was leaving the next day because I had to go back to work in DC. And what happened next? Well, he came out of that door, and I came out of there with a job. <laughs> Back in those days, when you were a girl, if you were going to college, you were either going to be a nurse or a teacher. I didn't feel like I had enough science, and I didn't like blood, so teaching seemed to be the natural navigation. Before Oklahoma City schools were integrated, I walked into an all-black school and met the principal, Moses Miller. He hired me, sight unseen, because they needed teachers badly. He opened the drawer in his desk, pulled out a rubber hose, slammed it down, and said, Young lady, you are very small. I suggest you use this and use it well, or those boys will run all over you. And I went, Oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? Principal Miller was quite correct in the fact that the big kids red light, <laughs> green light, <laughs> trying to run all over me. I had fifth and sixth graders that were six feet tall, guys who had been retained. The faculty that were African American, they took red me. light, <laughs> green light, under their wings to teach me the culture, teach me how to survive. One of my favorite stories is Red Red Light, Green Light. Green Light. I stepped out into the hall one day and they were doing this. I was teaching something and one of the young men ran by and hollered an obscenity as he stopped by my door. I grabbed him by the lapels, shoved him against the wall and said, don't you use that language around me or around my class. Later, I learned that this is Sun Tzu's theory of war. Pick the biggest, baddest guy there and convince him you're the boss. <laughs> I moved into the neighborhood to acculturate myself. Got to go for the first time to black nightclubs and black churches and really get inside. Understand what made my kids tick. I had some really, really ornery students. And I had some really, really wonderful students that responded greatly to having someone who cared about what happened to them. At OSU, I was initially interested in politics. Political science was going to be my direction. Art was just something I could do, but never really did it, hardly, once I grew up. I don't think I picked up one pencil, one paintbrush the whole time. I arm wrestled a bit. I had a dear person in my life that was killed in an accident during that time. The one I was going to marry if I married anybody because I always grew up saying, I'm never getting married. He got killed. He got decapitated. A boat went through the windshield of his car. I had to come home after that. It was just upheaval. While I was teaching, and going to school to get my principal certification, the Oklahoma City teachers decided to strike. I wasn't a union member because, frankly, I couldn't afford the dues. I was a single mom then, couldn't figure out how in the world to feed my kids, and my friends were going, You, you can't, can't cross the line. line. You, you can't, can't cross, cross the line. line. One of the elders at church said, Why don't you join the Air National Guard? I joined as an airman basic with a master's degree. Went off to basic training while the teachers were on strike. I didn't have to cross the picket line, 
and I didn't have to lose my salary. I went to a summer workshop at the University of Colorado on American Indian Affairs. There were Indian college students from all over the country, some tribes I'd never even heard of. Some tribes from Alaska Natives, Kaiser Aquatic people from Maine, people from California, the Northern Plains, New Mexico, Arizona. For the first time, we were given American Indian history from a Native perspective. Federal Indian policy, what happened after European contact, how this influenced Native people. We used to think, what is wrong with us Indian people? I've learned, why can't we be more successful? Why are we at the bottom of the ladder? Why? Why? And I had a better understanding. It was a real eye-opener. I majored in accounting and economics and interviewed to go to South America to Venezuela as an accountant for an oil company. I got word back from them that they did not send single women to Venezuela, which really ticked me off. Well, a friend of mine who was head of the Department of Human Services in Seminole County asked me if I would take an exam to be a social worker. I took it and went to work for the Seminole County Department of Welfare and had a caseload of 450 old age, aid to the disabled, and aid to dependent children. Oh. Kin folks knew it by heart in Tulsa and Broken Arrow. My teacher cherished it in Drumright. The California cousins had heard of it in oil field country. Nothing to be done with a child like that, the aunts would kindly tell my mother. Just give her some paper and a new pencil and let her write it out of her system. <laughs> At the time, there was a lot of discrimination against Native people. You struggled with that and you struggled with stereotypes. My late husband, Clyde and I, we had to run a summer program for middle school students. I was running an upward bound program at Northern College. Anyway, I received an application for Harvard. I thought, Harvard? I can't afford to go to Harvard. I'm not a real brain or genius. So I didn't apply. Then I got a phone call explaining. They invited people that had been out of college for a couple of years who were doing work oriented to community development. So I applied, was accepted. There were 11 university students, a very diverse tribal group. They treated you so much different there. You were treated like you were smart. I thought, wow, what would happen to our educational systems if all the teachers treated all the students like they were smart? I've always said I'd rather be lucky than good. I was kind of moving around the guard. I was education officer at the time, which made sense. But for whatever reason, Colonel Strickland and Colonel Raisin decided the base needed a woman commander who put me in services. It would be appropriate for a woman because it's food and housekeeping. <laughs> but the wartime tasking for that job was mortuary. It happened to be the time that the Gulf War kicked off. So being a mortuary officer, fully qualified in services, we were called to backfill the Air Force. It was very brief, a 12-day engagement, but I did my first autopsy. Our unit won outstanding unit in the Air Force two years in a row. My first real social work was a man who was on old age assistance. I read his record before. It said he had a bad sore on his hand, and when I visited him, he had a bandage there, and I said, is that the same sore you had a year ago? And he said, yes. And he told me that he had gone to University Hospital and they wanted to cut his hand off because it was cancer, but he wasn't about to let them. And I got him to agree that if I could get him seen in a medical clinic rather than surgical, that he would go back. We made those arrangements. He went to the medical clinic. They did not cut his hand off. They did radiation and saved his hand. I had some things happen in my life that hurt me and were not good for me. And I remember the day that I decided to be an artist, to try to be an artist. I was downstairs in what used to be my bedroom. It had no windows and I was there in the dark. I was there a few days thinking, I've got to change my life. I just can't stand the way I'm feeling. I just can't live like this anymore. Then it came to me that I had art flowing in my blood. So I made a promise to myself that I would try for a year to paint. 
I would paint every day for a year, whether it would be five minutes or an hour or five hours. Every day I would sit down and do art, see where that led me. Once I was back in Oklahoma and settled, and I worked in misdemeanors and DUI and prosecuting sex crimes, Senator Porter got on television and announced he wasn't going to seat his Senate seat anymore. I thought, well, he didn't tell me. Like he had to tell me, like it was his to give me. It belonged to the people. But I had made up my mind that I was going to run for his seat against my mother's advice. Vicki, you just got here. Don't tell the man I want to go do this, and if I don't make it, can I come back? That's exactly what I had asked Mr. Macy. He said, Of course you can, but I'm willing to bet you're not coming back, partner. <laughs> I followed a lot of advice from Hannah Atkins and the campaign workbook, how to run and how to win office as a woman. There's a chapter on running against an incumbent because Senator Porter changed his mind about not running and about targeting and how you look at election returns for those two races for that candidate that you're running against. There were 32 precincts for nearly 22 years. Senator Porter had only won 11 of those 32 precincts. So I zoomed in on those 11 precincts. So what was his number one vote getting precinct? Garden Oaks. That's where my mother had taught kindergarten for 40 some odd years. His second top vote getting precinct was over on Martin Luther King Avenue. Well, my dad was the assistant principal at Moon Junior High School and at Douglas. He taught at Douglas for hundreds of years. My first really big job was director of Indian Affair education for Albuquerque schools, 117 <coughs> schools with 3,300 Indian students from over 100 tribes. I wanted the job, and I did get the job. I was just traumatized. All the responsibility, I thought, now what am I going to do? It was with Uncle that I went to those first art shows. All those artists doing artwork all over the country, we'd meet there and we'd just have the best time. I was young and I was unattached and I just had a blast. I didn't drink or anything. I had given up alcohol the same time as I had made the promise that I was going to paint. I was just a free spirit, sober, happy artist woman up there, living it up with all the artists, having a great time selling my work and starting out. Without my consent, the cycle turns, sets the seasons, peach hot August follows Blackberry July. But already this blowy April day, I am planning for winter which doesn't seem right with the iris nodding about me, thin-veined and elegant. So, I've been a flight commander and three squadron officer commanders with the guard, and I'm still working in the public schools as a principal, and the wing commander calls me in. I want you to come work for me full time and I'll promise you a colonel's slot. And there hadn't been any women colonels in the guard. Sir, I've only got 24 years in the school business. I can't afford to leave because there's not that much teaching time left before retirement. This is what an active duty colonel makes. It was double what I made as a principal. And I said, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I worked at Griffin Memorial Hospital in the social work department. And in 1967, I moved back to Tulsa and was in charge of the aftercare program for the Department of Mental Health in Tulsa County. While I was doing that, I was asked to apply for the job of Executive Director of Planned Parenthood. I learned how to lobby. I learned how to organize to accomplish things. During the right to life agitation, I would have to go down to the clinic in the middle of the night because the windows had been broken out. The police would not let me work at night because the shot from across the bridge to the window of my office was a pretty direct shot. I was led to do art the way I do it now. I had to do it that way. It wasn't a conscious decision for me to paint women in the different ways I do. It was a need. 
I had to lay out a direction for myself. My life was so in disarray and painful that something came out to show me the way. I, I was scared. I guess I had talent somewhere inside, but it really didn't show up too well. You have to sit there and do it to get it done, and I was always on the go from one thing to the next. To be an artist, you have to calm down as best you can. Artists are wild people a lot of the times, or the ones I've known are. I'm a wild person. The first bill that I ever presented to the Senate was a Senate joint resolution, which was easier than a House bill to create a literacy task force. I carried a House bill in the Senate dealing with prenatal care in Oklahoma. You get out of Tulsa and Oklahoma City into the rural areas, and there were counties with absolutely zero care for pregnant women. Oh, and I had a mammogram bill that was signed finally by Governor Bellman. Little old naive me, thinking about old Ben Franklin. An ounce of prevention is worth, worth a pound of cure. cure. Not appreciating the argument of mandated coverage by insurance companies. Obviously, it's not something they favor because it's a cost issue for them. Come inside, folks, and see the mess. I'm making applesauce. Maybe it doesn't pay in the long run to buy sugar and jars, but someone gave me a box of red apples. Said I did them a favor a long time ago when things were really hard. I can't remember what it was to save my life. My mother had moved home. She was getting up in age. She said, you need to come home and work with your own people. You've never done that. You've been out there working with other tribes and other native communities, and you're doing some good work. But that's why you went to school. So I moved home. The first term, I was appointed as a member of the business committee. I served as a member for three years. Then, we were asked, then was asked by several tribal members to run for tribal chair. I ran against four male tribal members and I won. I took a lot of flack for that. I was elected, but there were a lot of people that felt it wasn't a woman's place to be leading the tribe. So there was always that resistance. We had 10 goals. We made progress on all of those goals. The tribe began to buy back land. We developed our own water utility company. I was there as chair for four years. So I didn't get to really accomplish as much as I wanted. I had to compromise. Every day was a growth process for me. There was a senator who had absolutely no interest in a mammogram bill. And I thought, well, he has a mother, and he has daughters, and he has a wife. I talked to him and shared why I thought it was important, why I make the dollars and cents for insurance companies. By the time that bill was actually signed by Governor Bellman, it was not my original bill. It was my bill tacked onto a funeral home bill. <laughs> But it was passed, and he voted for it. That's how to get things done. Working with your own tribe is more difficult than working for another tribe. A lot of that has to do with animosities that go back 100 years, mistrust against the federal government, because they feel that anyone who gets into those positions will become corrupt. You're constantly having to defend yourself and put out fires. I had one recall, and then I, when, when I did when I was just a committee member, we went through an ouster. In both cases, I fought back. I was not going to be run off because of a lot of untruths and downright lies and wrong information. They falsified the recall petition. People had signed for other people. They put people's names on who were deceased. It was very expensive, but I felt, if I don't have a good reputation, <coughs> a good name, then I have nothing. The petition was thrown out of court. Sister finally got a storm named after her. How fitting. I bet the winds are angry auburn color and they have their say, however long it takes to blow anger out to sea. As tiger women, we're all headstrong. I had to venture out and find my own spot. I did that through my sales of my art. I had enough money to get my own place. I look back now and I know that really helped save me because my brother Chris, he was a creative, gifted, lovely, gorgeous human being that so many people loved. He was murdered in 1990.
<laughs> general Aragon, we need a female general officer that will uh, not necessarily be incensed by the lack of a uh, political correctness of the Russian military. <laughs> Darling, do you know where I'm from? <laughs> I'm from Oklahoma. We grade political incorrectness. <laughs> to meet with the Russians and bridge the gender gap. I have on a fur coat and my little high-heeled boots, and I walk into the hall where we're supposed to sign in, pulling my little suitcase behind me. They fit you with these little earpieces because the only Russian I know I learned on the hunt for Red October. <laughs> and I was asked there by one of the Russian generals if my father had allowed me to join the military. <laughs> Well, no, I was already an adult. I was a mother of two children, and I decided to join myself. Well, I have two daughters. I never let them join military. <laughs> really? What's wrong with them? <laughs> and this little man, who's about my height and weighs 300 pounds, he comes up and says, So, you are a woman general. Yes, I'm Rita Aragon from Oklahoma. It's a pleasure to meet you. You're not real general. You're a Hollywood general. You're just for show. And so begins my experience at Harvard. Every night we'd have these wonderful dinners. The first night, Harvard sponsored it. Lobster and crab. Then the Air Force hosted. Steak. When the Russians host, dill pickles, pickle cucumbers, pickle beets, pickle pigs feet, pickle chicken something or other, and vodka. <laughs> Beside every place setting was a huge decanter of 180 proof vodka. And I'm going, uh oh. Because drinking vodka is how they tear down their enemies. They absolutely get them blottoed. This was a military dining in, so every person would have a toast. You throw back the drink, you turn the cup upside down on your head to prove you've emptied it. I have the fifth toast. Because they figured I'd be comatose after that with 180 proof vodka. And I thought, you have no idea. And so we started. President Putin, blah de blah, Nostrovia. George W. Bush, general greatest military, <laughs> greatest military mind on the face of the earth. Blah de blah, cheers. And my knees buckle. Literally, I'm going, I will never make it to five. But we sat down and they said, now start your food. My head is spinning, my throat's on fire, my stomach's on fire. Think quick, quick think. I had on a suit jacket. I pick up my bottle, tuck it under my jacket and said, gentlemen, if you'll excuse me, I need to go to the ladies room. <laughs> I pour out the vodka, I fill it up with water, I threw up the first two I had already drank, and I head back in. <laughs> Thank you very much. Little General, do not hurt yourself. I'm no longer Hollywood General, now I'm just Little General. Little General, Russian vodka is made for men. You will hurt yourself severely. Thank you, Yuri. That is so kind of you. You know, in Oklahoma, we drink a lot of vodka. It's kind of like our state drink. <laughs> I'd like to propose a toast to those men who on silver wings defy Earth's gravity to fly into the face of God and rain terror down upon the enemies of the United States of America. <laughs> They love it when you talk about death and dying. <laughs> then I notice the Americans start literally falling out of their chairs across the room. The end of the evening, I'm still toasting with the Russians. <laughs> and of course, I'm acting a little tipsy, but Klashnikov comes over with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the four star, and they look at me. 
You, you are a real general. <laughs> well, yes, I am. <laughs> Everyone laughs when I talk about that, but the most important skill you have is your brain. You don't have to be the toughest, and you don't have to drink the most vodka, but you do have to be smart. And you have to figure out what your enemy is expecting, and you have to counter that. <laughs> I painted what I knew to be the real deal without even knowing that's what I was doing. Looking back, I see powerful women. I saw my mother powerful all her life. I saw Indian women. I saw women doing all kinds of amazing things. So I really didn't even think about it at the time. I, I wasn't, wasn't thinking, aha, well, paint this because it's true. I just did it because it came to me to do it that way. David Warren sponsored my nomination for chief federal prosecutor and for the federal bench. I was appointed a federal judge by President Clinton in 1994. I love being a judge in the Western District of Oklahoma. You're a body joined together by your constitutional existence, and there are limitations, as there should be. The oath I took to honor the Constitution, to follow the law, it's a sacred trust. I had someone who was anti-Planned Parenthood say to me, why are your customers growing and why do they keep coming to you when they can get totally free service at the city county health department? And I said, because we treat them like people and deliver good services the way they want and need them. There have been a lot of changes over the last 40 years. Indian people running their own schools, their own programs. You go to any tribe in the country, and they're running like any other government. They have their services, they have their own health programs and law enforcement. More students are going to college. Young students that are growing up feel a greater sense of pride in being a native person. Oklahoma, I always feel so happy here. It's home. Whenever I cross that line, I just feel really happy. Happy to be back in Oklahoma even though I don't always love the weather. <laughs> I borrowed the book two times that first summer, ashamed for Miss Plumley, but not too ashamed to check it out. I became addicted. I could not do without it. I was the barefoot Circe, the enchantress with an island of my own. Wine, dark seas, no muddy Cimarron, I sat in peaceful groves, not a cotton chopping hoe in sight. But let me now say, for the sake of the heart and the length of the years, my home was never in Ithaca, so very far away from red dirt and blackjack country, and I was never Circe.